My name is Ali Khani. I'm the founder of Muslim Tech Collaborative, first at Berkeley, now in the Bay Area and nationally. Um, and I'm also joined here by... Assalamualaikum, everyone. My name is Daniel. Assalamualaikum, everyone. I'm Rahan. Assalamualaikum, everyone. My name is Sana. And we'll be joined by Malik very shortly. Uh, traffic, unfortunately, is very bad at rush hour, so inshallah, please bear with us. But yeah, uh, let's get straight into it. So, assalamualaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to Breaking Down the UC Application by MTC Berkeley. So you may be wondering, who exactly are we here at the Muslim Tech Collaborative? We're coders, creatives, change makers, a community, and more importantly, a collaborative. And what that means is we're a home for Muslims in tech to create positive, tangible impact, to leverage our skills to actually create real impact that benefits Muslims, that benefits the world around us, because you can have resume builders all you want, but if you're actually creating real impact and people are actually benefiting from the work you do, that in itself is a sadaqah jariya. So, you might wonder, how exactly do we do that here in Berkeley? So, we build technical projects. Uh, this photo right here in the top left corner is actually from when we finished the Five Pillar Cemetery project. Uh, Sister Shazia actually treated us out all to a lovely dinner uh, in Berkeley. We teach workshops, kind of like this one, also coding workshops at local Islamic schools every Friday, coming through intro to Python, intro to cybersecurity, a lot of cool things that we're working on. We also host a lot of talks, including founders of multi-million dollar companies, Muslim founders specifically, and also collaborating with a lot of notable organizations, whether it's the Friday Network, whether it's the Sitarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, and many more. And lastly, we also just work to solve problems. But the number one thing about MTC is really just the fact that we have a very tight-knit community. We have hundreds of people just in Berkeley alone, and across the nation, even hundreds, inshallah, thousands more. And, you know, we do a lot of different things. But the number one thing is, is that every single MTC chapter that there is out in the U.S., alhamdulillah, now 15 in the works. We started at one back in March, or sorry, back in March of 2023, but also March of 2024 was actually like where we started expanding from one to 15 chapters. So we're out as far as Ohio and Georgia. So alhamdulillah, like a lot of a lot of growth in the past couple of months, and we're very excited to you know be the OGs here in Berkeley and work with you guys. And we're also working on regional chapters, building out bases in the Bay Area, SoCal, the Midwest, and Atlanta. But yeah, at the end of the day, MTC is what it is because of the people, and we're very grateful for everything, you know, all the opportunities that we've had and all, all the opportunities that we have the chance to create. So inshallah, we hope that this workshop will benefit every single one of us, uh, and you know, we all walk out of here having learned something. But yeah, so a little bit about today's agenda. As the title says, we'll be breaking down the UC application, what that looks like, how you actually apply, what the UC is looking for, and kind of just understanding like what exactly is the process, what does it look like, and how to get into the schools of your choice. The next part is starting your first draft, kind of figuring out for those of you that are seniors, I saw a lot of hands raised, also a lot of juniors that, you know, once you get into spring, you kind of start thinking about like, oh, what, what exactly are my college essays going to look like? So we're going to give you some actual tangible strategies for how to actually get started, show you guys some example essays, and yeah, just give you the tools that you need to get started. And lastly, we are joined by a lovely panel and talking about a lot of different pathways to college. Um, this panel is actually not all tech majors as well. Uh, we're represented with like business, pre-med, so you know we have something for everyone. Uh, and lastly, just kind of sharing resources and next steps for how you can benefit. So for breaking down the UC application, handing it off to Sana. Uh, bottom one goes forward. Yeah. Salam, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? So um, you might be asking yourself, what is the UC? So the UC stands for University of California, and it's one of three public higher education systems in the state of California. So there's UC, there's CSU, which is Cal State Universities, and then there are CCs, which are California Community Colleges. So some of us up here have gone to CC, and some of us have gone straight to the UC. Oh, sorry. Um, we have, sorry. Okay. 
Sorry about that. We have nine total campuses. So in terms of NorCal, there's Davis, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, and Merced. And when you go down to SoCal, you'll see Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Diego. Uh, I think Irvine's missing off that. But um, the UCs are known for research and grad programs. So the UCs are usually ranked off of um, their PhD programs and the research that they do. So Berkeley's rated pretty high in terms of um, the contributions it's made for um, scientific like findings. Um, CSUs are known to be more vocational in their education style, so that means um, they typically focus on more um, job skills and getting ready for the workforce. So the best part about the UC app is that there's one centralized application for all nine UCs. So if you've heard of the Common app, it's kind of similar to that. Um, you don't really have to apply to every single one individually. All your essays, all your information will go straight to whatever UCs you decide to apply to. So going to the first section of the application, you're going to fill in um, about you, which is typical, like, um, name, your parents' names, their education backgrounds, um, where you're from. Uh, I think it also asks for your family income, so just pretty logistical questions that the UC uses um, in terms of your admission. Then um, you're going to move on and select your campuses and majors. So um, typically, you'll select the campuses, campuses you're only applying to, so you don't have to apply to every single one if you don't want to. I personally only apply to four. Um, you'll have the choice of first and backup majors. So some UCs don't accept backup majors, which is, I think, Berkeley, UCLA, and UC San Diego, if I'm correct. Um, but definitely double check that. And for some campuses, uh, there's different colleges within the university. So for example, at Berkeley, we have the Haas School of Business, and then we also have the College of Letters and Science. Um, so that will also differ based on the UC you're applying to. UC San Diego has different colleges based on, um, I think, your general field instead of specific majors. And then um, the second part, or the third part, is your academic history where you'll be reporting your coursework and grades. So this isn't verified until you submit your transcripts to the school. And then they'll double check um, everything you said was true. And um, this includes both high school and community college uh, grades. So everything you took in high school plus community college if you're a freshman applicant. And I think for transfer applicants, they only check your um, community college classes and grades. And then um, you'll want to put in all the colleges you attended if you're a transfer and will attend before you see. So if you go to multiple community colleges just to get different classes out of the way, you'll want to report every single one of those. And um, refer to your unofficial transcripts when you do this because you don't want to report some incorrect information because sometimes they'll think you got an A in one class and you actually got a B and then they might rescind your offer if it's incorrect. That's up to them, but um, you just want to be careful when it comes to that. So moving on, we have test scores. So if you're a freshman applicant, this matters for you. Um, you have to report past and future AP, IB, English, profici English proficiency, which is TOEFL, and international exams. So this isn't relevant if you're a transfer applicant, but um, if you are a freshman applicant, so you're in high school right now, this, to, to all those seniors out here, this is going to be really important for you. Um, I think some schools are no longer requiring um, test scores, so definitely check with your counselor on that. Um, scholarships and programs, I think there's an application, or sorry, a section in the application where you can um, select any scholarships you want to apply to, um, programs that might apply to you, and um, can help give you more benefits when you end up going to a UC. And the final section is activities and awards. So you want to list all your extracurriculars, awards, achievements, anything you've done during high school if you're a freshman applicant or community college if you're a transfer um, that will help show and demonstrate your leadership skills and everything you've done 
and want to con continue doing after you um, start at the UC. So we want to emphasize that it's not just quantity, it's also quality. So you don't want to put all of your activities filled out, even though you were just a general member in a club. You want to demonstrate um, impactful leadership skills. And uh, each activity is, there's a description, so each one is limited to 350 characters, not words. So to make the most of the activities and awards section, like I said earlier, you don't want to, you don't need to fill all 20 slots. It's nice if you do, that's going to show that you've done a lot of work outside of just your academics. Um, but you want to make sure you're concise with every activity that um, you're listing because you have only 30, 350 characters and not words. So make sure you're pretty specific on the achievements that you're making with each activity and emphasize the impact. So you wanna highlight tangible, measurable impacts um, that you achieved with those activities, um, just to emphasize like the leadership skills that you've demonstrated. And then also include responsibilities, how you exhibited leadership skills, like I said, and um, quantify the time commitment. I think this one's really important. So you can say like, yeah, I volunteered at the mosque for like four months, but four months doesn't really mean anything because we don't know like if you went every day or if you went every week or you went once a month. You want to be pretty precise in um, like how many hours you volunteered. So moving on to the actual essay questions, um, UC calls these PIQs, which stands for personal insight questions. And um, you have eight options total and you wanna pick four to answer. And each one is limited to, to only 350 words. And you want to answer these to show the UCs who you are as a person. You don't wanna just be your grades and your activities and your awards and like you wanna seem more holistic. You want to seem like a real person. So starting off with the first prompt, um, we have describe an example of your leadership experience in which you have positively influenced others, help resolve disputes, or contributed to group efforts over time. Um, with this, you could probably go off of one of your activity experiences and find a specific instance that you want to talk about and share a story. So second one, every person has a creative side and it can be expressed in many ways, problem solving, original and innovative thinking, and artistically, to name a few. Describe how you express your creative side. So if you aren't like a CS major, there's options that, for example, if you're into arts or humanities, you can talk more about your personal experiences, not just the achievements, oh, I was in the CS club and we did this. So there's other options too. And the third question, what would you say is your greatest talent or skill? How have you developed and demonstrated that talent over time? Moving on to the fourth, describe how you have taken advantage of a significant educational opportunity or work to overcome an educational barrier you have faced. So this one's really good if maybe you failed a class or you had a hard time in one class. And so for example, I know someone who took Calc 1 and got a C, and then the next semester he took Calc 2 and got an A. So if you wanna talk about something like that, how you worked really hard to overcome an academic challenge or a personal challenge or something in one of your activity experiences, this is a really good one to answer. And the fifth question, describe the most significant challenge you have faced and the steps you have taken to overcome this challenge. How has this challenge affected your academic achievement? And the sixth question, think about an academic subject that inspires you. Describe how you have furthered this interest inside and or outside of the classroom. And this is the sixth question for transfers. So instead of the previous question, if you're a transfer, this is the question you'll have instead. And be sure to note that this question is actually required for all transfers. And it is asking, please describe how you've prepared for your intended major, including your readiness to succeed in your upper division courses once you enroll in the university. So you wanna answer this one really well and what a counselor advised me is answer it more of 
as if you were in an interview. Um, they're asking you as an adult. You're not really a teenager anymore in high school. Um, they want to see how you have prepared in college and outside of um, your academics to succeed at the UC. And the seventh question, what have you done to make your school or community a better place? And finally, the eighth question, beyond what has already been shared in your application, what do you believe makes you a good, sorry, makes you a strong candidate for admissions to the University of California? So I'll pass it off to Ali and he can talk a little bit more on how to get started. All right, so, oh, I do need the clicker. All right, so the moment that you might have been waiting for, but how do you actually get started on your first draft. So let's go a little bit into it. The hardest part of writing is getting started. You're going to be thinking about what do I want to talk about? It's sure, maybe you have like a lot of different parts of yourself that you want to talk about, but all of a sudden when you have to put pen to paper, then it's like, yo, what do I talk about? And so I wanted to share a couple quotes about, you know, what people have said uh, in the years that I've been advising like college app essays. First question is, what should I even write about? Another question was, I don't even know what's interesting about me. And this is uh, a question that I myself have also said. And then lastly, for some other people, there is just way too much lore to cover. And the hardest part about writing, about building anything, is how do you get started? So I think that's like one of the biggest challenges that most people face when writing college app essays. For those of you that are about to apply, uh, fear not. You are not too late. It is. Okay, it's still August. So it's still August, and a lot of the UC applications are due November 30th, if I remember correctly. So you have a little bit of time. You have, I would say this is technically a head start. And the fact that you're here is probably a really good sign that you are already thinking about writing your essays. So how exactly do we get started? Step one is meet yourself. So when you're meeting yourself, you want to keep it as brief and as succinct as possible. You want to think about the most interesting things about yourself, and how do I tell that to someone else? So there are four PIQs that you have to answer, four essays, which means that there's four parts of yourself that you have to tell someone. So if I'm going up to anyone on this panel, I want to tell Daniel one story, I want to tell Rehan one story, I want to tell Malik another story, and I want to tell Sana one story. And if all of them talk to each other, they should be very distinct stories, and they should be so interesting that if they're talking to each other about me, it's like, yo, are we talking about the same guy? So you want to make sure that these are four different parts of you that make a whole. So you think about what are four stories that you need to tell? Not that you want to tell, but that you need to tell. What are four stories that are so essential to who you are that if someone is reading about you, that's the stuff you want them to know about you? Oh, sorry, that goes backwards. So again, don't think of them as essay topics because as soon as you start thinking about the nitty gritty, it gets very overwhelming. Do not think about four essay topics to write about. Think about four parts of you that make up who you are. These are four parts that make you whole. So the second step is now that you know what to talk about, make an outline. Number one part of writing. So a rough idea of how you might do that is the 20-40-40 approach. And this is something that my mentors taught me and I'd like to share with you guys. This is how you actually structure your essay to make it actually impactful. So what is the 20-40-40 like, approach? So there's 20% of the intro and hook. This is the part that's pure storytelling, right? I was like five years old and I picked up a lightsaber and all of a sudden I am like, Star Wars is part of my personality. True story. Then you want to talk about what you did and how you did it. So sure, now I've got your attention. What do I talk about now? So maybe now this translates into talking about how my passion for Star Wars all of a sudden led me into getting into astronomy and maybe looking into like tinkering around with like Arduino kits to like work on robotics. Maybe I was looking at like, oh, how would I be able to like recreate C3PO's voice and like use it to spew brain rot? So that could be something that led to my passion and what I did, how I did it. And lastly, the, 40, the last 40% is the part that most people tend to miss. And this is the reason that most essays tend to fall apart is what did you learn from it? And this is the hardest part of any essay, is most people will focus too much on the storytelling, or most people will focus too much on like talking about what they did and how they did and how cool it is, but they will not talk about what you learned. 
Because at the end of the day, what you learned is actually what makes you who you are. What are the insights? What are the personal insights that they can get out of these questions from you? So let's actually look into what that might look like once you actually have that outline. So I like to call this word vomit in the sense of you're not thinking too hard about it. It's not that deep. No fluff, no formatting, no making it cutesy and pretty and flowery. I do this a lot too. Just write. Literally just start writing. Pen to paper, it doesn't matter like if it's like pure stream of consciousness. Don't worry about like, oh, does this like actually make like coherent sense? Like, is this even an actual sentence? Just write. Simple as that. Don't worry about word count. There's 350 words maximum for each one of these PIQs. Don't worry about the word count. Don't worry if it's too long, too short. You just want to get that outline and just write something bad because your final perfect draft will be a very different draft than the first one you write, but you need to start somewhere. So one last thing, uh, this is for the modern times. Do not GPT it. I know it's very tempting. I use GPT a lot. I know, okay, low key show of hands. Who's used GPT for an essay? No snitches. Okay, who's used GPT in general? All right, there we go. There's the show of hands I was looking for. So do not GPT it. It helps you a lot with brainstorming, but this is a story about you, not a story about stuff from the internet. So just purely write it on your own. You can use it for formatting and editing, but just don't GPT it to start off with. So it does not matter how incoherent it sounds. You just want to start writing. All right, quick question for the audience. Just start. One more time, just start. Simple. So what might that look like once you've started writing and you're able to edit it afterwards? So again, in short, uh, just a quick outline of talking about how to make outlines. Choose the story you want to tell. Ma sorry, choose the story you want to tell, make an outline for it, and just start with writing this up. Um, one usual trick that works is like write the body first, then the intro, then the conclusion, because it's like it's easy to talk about what you did, then figure out how to make it interesting, and then like talk about what you actually learned once you have like a little story to tell. So be concise once you start editing. All right, we've already covered most of this stuff, but yeah, yeah, this is the actual fun stuff. So. Example essays. Um, I will also add a disclaimer for the folks that wrote these essays that some details may have been embellished for college app purposes. But getting into the very first one. Yes. OK, so this question was, what have you done to make your school or community a better place? Uh, we understand this is not readable, so thankfully we have these a little bit more zoomed in. But I'll just read it off just for convenience's sake. So this is the intro to Hook. This is the first 20% of your essay. Drawers were filled with moldy pizza crusts and crumpled up paper plates. Crayon scribbles across the walls. Closets shoveled full with broken vacuum cleaners and a ping pong table with no legs. No legs. The abandoned upstairs loft of the community mosque was the only place my friends and I could wait out the summer heat. But the reek of aged pizza sauce had deterred people away for years, leaving the area in a state of absolute disrepair. Hot diggity, dude, I muttered to the group. We got to do something about this. Next part is what you did and how you did it. The seven of us returned the next day, each member of my brigade armed with garbage bags and Clorox wipes. Neglected rooms soon became bustling chambers filled with roaring vacuums and the stinging scent of disinfectant. Joyful hollering echoed from room to room as my friends and I refurbished an old PC, cleaned the rugs, and tossed out ancient trash crammed into every corner. Our efforts for reviving and renewing the loft of the mosque did not go unnoticed. The mosque's imam left crates of peaches for us downstairs daily with a handwritten note that read for the seven dwarves. Word of our work spread through WhatsApp group chats and Facebook threads, and families across the neighborhoods helped us fundraise for equipment, furniture, and baby blue, pla baby blue paint to cover convert the loft into a game room. And lastly, the most important part, what you learned from it. Our restoration project has paved the way for us to host numerous community gatherings, game nights, and humanitarian donation drives. The ping pong table, now a centerpiece of the lot, has become a site for recreational tournaments, arts and craft projects, making masks and COVID relief kits, and preparing boxes of donated food and clothes for the disaster victims. The project began with the simple goal to turn an unused room into a habitable haven. Now, seeing others create their own meaningful impacts and experiences at the loft that we revived, I seek to continue inspiring others to join me in making change. 
Whether it's rewiring ancient PCs, repairing rust-covered bicycles, tutoring kids at the library, or just giving a ping pong table a new set of legs. How do we feel about that? So I'll hand it off to uh, Malik for the second. Net. Oh, sorry, Rahan. Song went one. All right, cool. So this is my example essay. I want to add, emphasize disclaimer, some details may have been embellished for college app purposes. So specifically, this was mine. I, mine was, what have you done to make the community a better place? So I'll just read this off. Upon starting my community, at my, upon starting community college, I joined the MSA to meet new people. At our first meeting, we only had six people in the club. And after being involved in the club for the whole year, I was elected president in the spring of 2022. And I wanted, I immediately jumped to the test to, during the summer. I devised an outreach strategy to expand the MSA to educate our members and inclusive values of Islam. I began by merging the Dianza and Foothill Community College MSAs to strengthen our community and forge wider connections. Uh, I also said, also since I have no prior, also since I had no prior experience running an MSA, I took initiative to learn about different leadership skills and tactics by reaching out to former and current presidents of MSAs of other colleges. They advised me on how to grow organizations by marketing the club, fostering community-minded events, and striking a balance between religious and a social organization. With this advice, I designed and posted flyers around campus to spread more awareness about our MSA to students. I also ensured our social media pages were more active with weekly, weekly posts, which resulted in 40% more followers. I intentionally chose to host events at various locations, parks, mosques, mall malls, to provide more exposure to the club's social and religious elements. For example, we hosted a game night where potential and current members for form new connections. As a result, 45 students joined the MSA. Consequently, the prayer rooms within the college became more active with several members praying together. Everyone is looking for community, identity, and camaraderie on a college campus, and we succeeded in doing this with the MSA. We also provided the opportunity to share information about our club and our faith to educate the wider com college community about the values of Islam. Thus, my commitment to creating an environment where Muslim students feel at home and included on campus allowed me to build a community that will last beyond my time at community college. I look forward to building to nurture safe environments that sustain diversity and inclusion at a UC campus. One of the biggest things that I did when it was reaching out, to, when I was writing this essay, I reached out to a few people and they told me, when you're doing this too, also emphasize that you say we when you're doing leadership. You know, you do this as a team, you work together. Emphasize stuff that you did too, but also emphasize you did it as a team. Another thing that I also did too was uh, uh, quantify. I think Sana talked about it earlier, quantify what you've done too. Uh, I said in one of the last paragraphs, which resulted in 40% more followers. UCs like to quantify, they're able to visualize it more. Another one was 45, I said 45 students joined the MSA, and in the first paragraph I said six. That shows a bit of growth. If you're able to do that, I think they're able to visualize growth. They, they like to see that. So yeah, a lot of this was just leadership. You show that I showed that I wanted to go out there, lead a group, and I showed the growth with that. And I think this was, I think, one of the essays that really helped me uh, get into Berkeley, I'd say. So yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, let's click through this. So we broke down every um, example essay, and so now going on to the third essay, again, disclaimer. Um, this essay is transfer specific, so um, if you look at the prompt, it is the required um, transfer essay, which is please describe how you have prepared for your intended major, including your readiness to succeed in your upper division courses once you enroll at the university. So just starting off um, with the intro, Brief, you can go under 20, it's 20, 40, 40, so you can go um, up or below 20 to some degree. I love math growing up. Although my interest was briefly impacted, interrupted in high school, my college algebra and trigonometry professor reawakened my passion for connecting 
by connecting the math world to the real world. She'd explain the logic of abstract com concepts such as an algebraic formula, then describe and work through practical solutions where they could be applied, like calculating population changes. So something really brief to start out with. Then you want to go into the gist of the essay, which is where you're really going to show the impact. So this is about 54% of this essay. That class also changed my perspective of the world. I realized math is a core part of life and the basis of application in a variety of disciplines and a solid foundation in problem solving. And a solid foundation in problem solving will prepare me for different fields in the future. As I completed more math classes, every new concept I learned brought me joy and excitement and intrigued me, encouraging me to discover how these ideas can be applied in real world situations. Outside of my math classes, I enjoy learning how math is applied in different fields. While taking an art history course, I eagerly look for the golden rectangle based on geometric proportionality and orthogonal lines based on projective geometry in Renaissance art. Recently, I had a lengthy discussion with a math professor about his research where he, walk, he talked me through the multivariable calculus he used to mathematically prove the curvature of a waxing or waning moon is elliptical instead of circular. Intrigued by how he used mathematical logic in problem solving, I'm currently doing independent study with him on proofwriting and how it can be used in academics, research, and applications in sciences such as astrophysics. And then you want to conclude with a reflection. So this one's about 29 to 30. So like I said, again, you can be a little off on 20, 40, 40. Although I was previously unable to participate in any math-related extracurricular activities due to family obligations, my recently reduced responsibilities have allowed me to explore new opportunities, such as the independent study, as well as joining the math club and Mu Alpha Theta Honor Society. I look forward to completing my upper division studies of math at UC and taking advantage of interdisciplinary research opportunities to contribute my math skills towards solving problems in a variety of different fields. I love to use critical mathematical analysis to solve real world problems and help society make further technical, technological and practical advancements. So I'll hand it back to Ali. All right, so we're just getting started soon with the panel, um, but I did want to talk a really quick minute for like what we're doing with MTC. Um, I feel like we didn't cover that too much before, but a large part of what we're doing with MTC is we're trying to build a multi-generational network of Muslims in tech across, whether it's at the college level, at the high school level, but even at the founders, investors, VCs. Um, just yesterday in Palo Alto, we held a 60 plus person networking event um, where we had founders going as young as like their early 20s to in their 70s and 80s. And the number one goal of what we're doing with MTC is for very far too long, we have been very, very far behind in terms of helping one another, especially when it comes into the industry. And as you might know, in the current world today, um, and especially like something that's become very apparent um, following October 7th with Palestine and the US, is Muslims are not in power. And we are very helpless because, frankly, we have a lot of capital that we're sitting on. There's a lot of money that we're sitting on. And we need to start putting that money to good work, to good use. And we need to start investing in one another, investing in our youth, and most importantly, like investing in Muslims. For a long time, we've always, like, you know, if there's, like, some Muslim founder that's coming up, it's like, if he's trying to pitch something, you know, someone might be like, brother, like, why are you only raising, like, why have you only made like 25000 a month with this startup? There is some other guy that's making like a million. And that's not the question we should be asking. It should be like, how should we help you? And I've been to a couple other cities this past summer. Um, just two weekends ago, I was in Atlanta, and we held you know, a Founders Networking Conference as well. We had a 15-year-old go up and pitch his cell phone accessory business. Um, and he was the very first person on stage. And the pitch was very new. Uh, he hadn't pitched before, so it was kind of like, you know, there's like certain parts of a pitch of like you make the ask, you know, you, you provide like a story, you provide what you're doing, you make an ask at the end of it. Um, missed pretty much every single note. But the first question that the audience asked was, how can we help you? And I think that's who we are as Muslims. We as Muslims, we give. We're, it's, it's part of our deen to give, you know, and it's to give without thinking twice, right? We, we have to help one another. 
And a big part of what we're doing with MTC is we're building this institutional power for Muslims. And, you know, we started very small. It started off with working on one project with MCC. Alhamdulillah, like, you know, if you asked me just five months ago, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have told you that we're like a national organization, that we're working with like people in Bay Area, in Atlanta, and more. So, like, if you're looking for a place to put your money to use, um, I do ask, like, if you can, like, you know, scan the QR code, donate to MTC. A lot of the work we're doing, you know, there's a lot of costs associated with it. So we ask that, you know, humble ask, um, please help us, like, with MTC Berkeley. At the end of the day, like, it, it takes a village. So, yeah, that's all from us. Uh, but yeah, moving on to the panel. So, the Pathways to College panel. We're joined by four amazing panelists from very different fields. But I won't be talking for too long, so handing it off to... Oh, sorry. My bad. Panelist intros. But yeah, these are our four panelists. Handing it off to Rehan. Start us off. You can sit too. Yeah. Exactly, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you guys again. I'm Rahan. Uh, so yeah, uh, I for high school. Just a fun fact: I went to Torrey Pines High School. It was in San Diego before I moved back to San Jose. And when I applied as a senior in high school, I think it was around COVID time. Uh, I got into UC Riverside. I got waitlisted at UC Santa Cruz, and then a few other out-of-state schools I got into. I committed to San Jose State first, and then I talked with a few people. I reached out, and they said, why don't you give De Anza College a try? Uh, De Anza, my dad went to De Anza, my uncles went to De Anza. And yeah, I'm very glad that I went there. And as a result, I just got to, uh, I'm now at Berkeley Humla. I'm majoring in business administration at the Haas School of Business. So yeah, uh, a lot of what I've learned was uh, through reaching out to people. Uh, when I was about to apply to Haas, I reached out to around 30 people. I went through LinkedIn. I said, "Hey, how was what's your advice to get in?" And most of the people that actually the people that actually helped me a lot were the Muslims. Uh, I was I wasn't now I'm like now looking back at it, I'm not surprised at all. But the people who helped me the most were the Muslims. They reviewed my essays. They gave me advice. They said, "Hey, do this. You know, quantify your numbers." They reviewed my essays. It was very helpful. So humla, yeah, and nice to meet you guys. So yeah. Assalamu my name is Malak. Um, I, oh, thank you. Uh, I graduated from Casa Grande High School back in 2020 and just graduated this last semester uh, from Berkeley in microbial biology. Um, yeah. And a little bit about me is that I grew up in North Bay and partially in Palestine. I'm the only bio major of my family, so the rest of my brothers did Mecki, and I chose to do the less paying job. Um, I'm an avid podcast listener. And then I'm also applying for schools right now, but graduate school. Yeah. Sound like everyone. Um, my name is Daniel. I um, am also a transfer student. No shame in the transfer game. So um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what I put up here. Oh yeah, so. Uh, my path to Berkeley, I think, is very non-conventional. Uh, my mother is like very into education, so um, I went to a lot of different kinds of schools. I did one semester at public high school. Um, then I spent the majority of my high school years in a boarding school in Tennessee. Um, I've been to private schools, charter schools, um, and I eventually ended up at DVC, which is, I'm sure some people in this room are familiar, um, UC DVC, forever represent. And so... At DVC, I so one thing, one piece of advice that I think I'm gonna give to that I want you guys to take home is that, like, a lot of the students who are applying to these like top tier UCs are gonna be very martial law accomplished. They're gonna have like 4.3 GPAs. They're gonna have like, you know, three businesses already acquired and stuff like that. It's ridiculous. So if you want to stand out and you are you know, everyone has a different path, and you might not have three businesses acquired. The, you, what you want to show is growth. And to be honest, my grades were not very good um, at all. 
And then so when I finally got my act together, alhamdulillah, like there was a clear sign of growth. There were bad grades and then there's good grades. So I really emphasize that in my uh, UC applications. And um, I think that is something that, I, you know, if you guys don't like, don't ever beat yourself up for, for having bad grades, like just use it as a growing um, uh, mechanism and, you know, emphasize that growth. And I think that'll help you guys stand out. So yeah, and then, um, um, yeah, and then for fun, I really like to train MMA and skateboard. I talked about skateboarding in one of my uh, applications um, essays, so I think that that um, really helped me out. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Salam, everyone. Oops, sorry. Um, my name's Sana, and I'm actually from Pleasanton. I grew up going to MCC, so I'm pretty familiar with everything here. Um, a little bit about me, um, I actually graduated high school early in my sophomore year, so I took the chess bee, I think it's called the high set now, so if you're familiar with chess bee, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I actually went to DVC as well, and I transferred in 2021, and now I started at Berkeley, and um, I'm going into my senior year, so I have a background in computer science, but I am also interested in what is called ISF at Berkeley, it's interdisciplinary studies. So my focus is, so I'm both tech and humanities, social sciences. So it's basically public policy. Um, it, it can be whatever you want, but I'm focusing in public policy, Islamophobia and um, sociology. There's, sorry, there's a little more. Um, just a little bit more. I was originally an applied math major. So at UC Berkeley, um, when I got in, it was a little easier to switch from math to CS. So I kind of took that route and then changed my mind later. And um, I love matcha. I had one earlier today. Again, I took the chess bee and I have two cats. All right, at this point, you're probably tired of seeing me, but my name is Ali Khani. Uh, I'm from Mountain House, California, but I went to Tracy High School. Uh, I also did um, the IGETSI, which is the Intersegmental General Education Transfer Curriculum. In short, it's just your general ed requirements. So I took CC classes in high school, uh, finished them all kind of at around the same time in 2021. So I know this kind of dates me like as a dinosaur, but I am now finishing up my final year uh, in computer science at Berkeley. So a little bit about who I am, where I started off. So yeah, I grew up in Mountain House. Uh, I did go to MCC Sunday School like back in the day. Uh, I was a really weird kid and I talked too much and I always got in trouble for it. Um, I was a big Star Wars fan, so that previous example I gave is actually a very true story. Um, I also did not want to do CS originally, CS being computer science. Uh, I was very much an astro, -geek, astro geek like growing up. So for most of my high school experience was actually um, much more geared towards astronomy and I didn't really like get into CS until like roughly my senior year, which, you know, is like, whoa, that's like too late. You're already applying to colleges. Um, but alhamdulillah, like, it was like, I just took like one CS class in Las Positas and all of a sudden I was like, hey, this professor is actually like not that bad and I actually kind of like this class even though it's COVID. And that was kind of how I got into it. But um, there were also like, a lot of different things I did in high school to kind of like pursue my passions. Um, so one was like Science Olympiad. That was kind of like where I was delving very deep into like my astro uh, background. And so like going throughout high school, I was like very much a big groupie. So like I would just join clubs like left and right. And I would honestly like recommend it. I think like the best way to meet people that actually have the same interests with you is in school clubs, be involved on campus uh, in whatever ways you see fit. But for me, it was like Science Olympiad was kind of my big thing. Uh, freshman year, the club was pretty much dead. All the board was seniors, so like they were all graduating. They didn't really care because they were applying to college already. Um, but then pretty much sophomore year, I ended up joining, um, I think it's called board. Yeah. So I ended up joining like as an officer for Science Olympiad. I was treasurer. Um, but even as treasurer, I was kind of like very try hard and I was like, oh, like we're doing the finances, but like, let's also like organize team meetings. And so like, I took a lot of matters into my own hands and I was like, oh, let's organize like team meeting, let's also like organize like, like let me hit up like a bunch of the teachers and ask them to stay an hour after school so we can like work like lab experiments in their classrooms. Um, and I think like a lot of it was just being very proactive. I ended up becoming president of Science Olympiad uh, in my junior year of college, or sorry, not college, sorry, high school, time flies. But in junior year of high school, the day before uh, our very first meeting, our Science Olympiad advisor and coach 
passed away. And all of a sudden, then the question became like, oh, how are we going to win states this, or how are we going to like win regionals go to states to like, how are we going to keep this club afloat? And so I think that was a really big turning point for me because then it was the question of like, do I give up or do I keep going? Um, and there was like, it was quite an uphill battle from there. I was like fighting with teachers like left and right that were like, oh, like Science Olympiad, like we don't have the funding. We don't like, it's too much like logistics and like, where are you going to get this money from? And then basically I'm going to the principal. I'm like, yo, like the teacher said, like, we don't have money, but like, do we really not have money? And the principal's like, we do. And I was like, we do. And so from there, it was like, okay, let me like fight with the chair of the science department to get this club to continue existing. And I actually ended up winning. And so alhamdulillah, like from there, it was like we were, I was just pushing left and right. I was like, guys, like get in on this, like get to work. Why have you not done this? And alhamdulillah, like I ended up working. We, we won regionals for the first time in 17 years and went to states. And then COVID happened, so states got canceled. And so we were like, okay, what do we do now? And so from there, like, and as you can tell, like Science Olympiad was very much my personality in high school. Then we were like, okay, let's actually start training the team over the summer and make our own curriculum so everyone's like ready to hit the ground running in fall. So fall comes around, it's online, but we're like, yo, we're already ready to go. Like this is just second nature. And so that ended up being like a very big part. I was also involved in the MSA, so we worked a lot with the Christian club actually, um, since our numbers were very small and theirs were too, but together it was like interfaith, like that's the collab. Um, so we were organizing like, like hurricane relief. Um, so at the time, this was like Hurricane Dorian. So we were organizing like a relief drive, like donations across campus. Um, and also like a big part of my high school was also like I was part of the tennis team for all four years. So I started off in doubles, ended up like playing in varsity singles. Um, and it was just like, it was just a great way to like talk to people. Most of us were nerds. So like, it was kind of like, oh, like we're like friends off the court and on the court. And then, yeah, community college classes and I get see. And lastly, I think this is the one that is like a little lesser known fact about me until very recently. But yeah, in high school, I was also like very viral on this like random question and answer website called Quora. If you guys know about Reddit, Quora is like if you took Reddit and made it like really snobby. So that's what Quora was. So that actually ended up translating into a lot of interesting skills that I did want to share. So a couple takeaways from my Quora journey. So when I was writing on Quora, this was around like freshman and sophomore year of high school. I just kind of accidentally stumbled into it. I was like, yo, here's the question. Let me write like a joke answer because like I was like writing under a pseudonym. So somehow like one thing led to another. I just kind of kept writing consistently, maybe like once a day, twice a day, um, maybe like once every two days. But I ended up garnering over six million views on Quora. I got a couple of my friends in on it. One of them also hit like a million on his own thing. And we kind of had this little like mini syndicate of friends that we were just like writing like really viral answers and going really viral. Uh, so that was cool. So I think one of the biggest takeaways from that though was like how to actually build an audience. And I think this is like relevant to college apps because at the end of the day, college apps are really just like how do you market yourself, right? How do you write to get people to like care about you, right? If I'm telling my story, you better listen because this is the most interesting story that you will hear. So being able to build an audience, being able to experiment with like different writing styles, figuring out like, okay, if I write something this way, who am I like getting their attention? If I'm trying to write to like, cause if you're trying to write with like people your age, you're probably just gonna write like all lowercase like this. Versus like, if you're trying to write to uncles, you have to be a little more formal. It's like, hello, salam alaikum, like best, you know, like you end up like everything with like best regards, warm regards. Versus like, if you're talking to people with your age, it's like, you can get a little more casual, use like more brain rot slang. And at the end of the day, the number one thing that I learned was apparently, and this is like a crazy takeaway, apparently social media influences people to do things. So that ended up being one of the biggest tools in the arsenal was how do you use media to influence people and also how to become aware of what media is influencing you. So I think this was kind of the point where I started realizing like, okay, how could I use like my level of influence to also give myself credibility? And I think this is one thing that for me is like still kind of a work in progress, but I didn't want to share this was, you know, a lot of people like make it to these really high points in life. You know, you're looking for people that are like two to three steps ahead of you. And you're like, how did someone get there? I think the number one thing is being able to ask for help. And this is like something I struggle with. Um, I'm like, an, I'm the oldest sibling and also the oldest cousin on both sides of my family. So for me, it's like, 
for me to talk to people older than me is like usually a little harder than talking to people younger than me. But here's kind of a quick breakdown for what's kind of gotten me through so far. So one, first and foremost, you want to identify the people that you actually want to reach out to. These are people that are maybe like two to three steps ahead, right? And it's in whatever specific domain you're looking for. The next thing is, if you're going to ask for their time, be very direct about what you're asking for, right? If I want to ask like Malak for like help on, you know, how do I write my essay? I'm not going to be like, hey, I thought your profile was really cool. And I was like, your accomplishments are really cool. And I was just going to be like, hey, I really like that you were doing X, Y, Z. You're working in something that I'm really interested in. Uh, do you think we could hop on like 15 minutes for a call and like I can just ask you about like writing my essay? Very direct. And this kind of led to the third point, which was like open yourself up to being helped, right? You, there's a level of like sharing a little bit of vulnerability, like, okay, I'm looking for like this kind of help because I'm at this point and I want your help. And I think this is the one thing where a lot of people fall off too, is help is not a one-off request, right? You want to keep updating your mentors. It could be something as simple as like, hey, Malik, I actually applied to like this like random position um, and I actually didn't get it, but like, I think I actually found this other position and I think I might be able to get that. So do you think you could take a look at it? Or if you get something, it's like, oh, hey, like small win, you know, this like really helped. Thank you so much. And lastly, I think this is like one um, that's like kind of a little implicit, but be the type of person that people want to help, right? If you seem like too closed off or you just like don't have enough of a presence or if you're just like, just kind of rude or annoying, like, you know, people don't really want to help you. But it's like, if you're like being personable, being respectful, people want to help you. So yeah. I don't remember if there's another slide after this. Yeah, four years of high school, four, year, four learnings. But one, every failure should be considered a point of growth. Um, the stuff I mentioned before were the wins. There were also a lot of losses. I tried to start an astronomy club. Two people showed up, and one of them was a teacher who was advising it. The other one was my friend that asked to come. That was pretty bad. <laughs> other failures, um, like I got bad grades in classes too. I was doing CC classes. Not all of them turned out too great. But the number one thing is, if you treat a failure like, man, it's Jover. Did you grow? Right? But if it's like, OK, that happened, what's the next move? I failed a CC class. Can I take that much on in the next semester? Maybe not. Or maybe it's like, oh, how do I bounce back from this? That's always the question you need to keep asking is like, OK, every loss is actually a lesson. right? Treat every loss like a lesson, and you can go insane trajectories. The next thing, I think this is very important for a lot of people in high school. You're very young, you're very impressionable. Surround your friend, your sur sorry, my bad. Surround yourself with friends who do strengthen your dean. Because at the end of the day, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So think about the people that you're friends with and ask yourself, do I want to be exactly like the people, do I want to be the people that my friends are? And if that's the that question is yes, then by all means, surround yourself with those people that make you a better person because you strive to be like in those qualities that you find good in them. I think that's a very, very like hard conversation to have with yourself, but it's a very important one. Uh, third, kind of going back to my journey, like going viral in Quora, be very mindful of the social media that you consume. The most successful creators understand how to leverage their audiences to do things. Like the, the secret side of influencing, there's two parts of it, right? There's the marketing part and the selling part. Marketing is how do you build an audience, and selling is how do you get that audience to do something that you want them to do. So a lot of influencers, the reason they're called influencers is because they have an audience and they know how to influence that audience to take a certain action. So a lot of brands will reach out to them. They'll be like, hey, like, we want to collab with you. It could be for a good thing. It could, be, it could be for a bad thing. That just depends on the creator. So be very mindful of the media that you consume because there is a lot of media out there. We are in like, the age of insane amounts of information. So be very, very mindful because it's very easy to go down rabbit holes. And lastly, um, like apply to scholarships, programs, internships, and everything. Um, this kind of like stemmed from my own experience. Like I was part of a lot of different things in high school. And the number one reason I was part of a lot of those things is literally just because I applied. So apply yourself. You have nothing to lose by not applying. Like don't reject yourself. Let them reject you. So that way you can go somewhere else and do something better. So yeah, that is all for me. And uh, now we'll open up to Q&A. Okay, we didn't think we'd get this far. All right, uh, is there anyone that can like help us like pass the mic around, or I can just do that too? All right, JazakAllah khair. All right, so any questions? 
Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Apply yourself. Um, okay, so did any of you say you were in uh, the health sciences? So what UC did you go to and kind of what led you to go into that? Um, so I ended up going to UC Berkeley. Um, and my whole reason of going into like health sciences, I graduated in microbial biology, uh, was actually because of a podcast that I used to listen to called like this, this podcast will kill you or whatever. And it was during COVID. So it was like the height of the epidemic. And I just took it upon myself to like really trying to learn what COVID is about, like in regards to public health and also like molecularly. Um, so that's really what like guided my interests. I just knew, I just knew that I didn't want to do mechanical engineering, which is what my brothers did. Uh, I wanted to work to help people. I was initially pre-med too. I should probably include that, but now I'm not. Um, I wanted to work with people and either help them systemically. So that's what I aim to do right now by going to grad school and then inshallah going into biotech or helping them one-on-one. -on -one. So in some sort of like healthcare field, like nursing. Yeah. Is there an easy way to know um, which colleges take what kind of kids? For example, like is there a GPA or what's the probability of getting admitted in each department as well as each UC, um, how do you choose that? Um, so specifically talking about UCs, there's this website, if you Google transfers by major, um, it's all the UC data of historical um, admission. So you can see the GPA ranges of everyone who got in um, for specific majors. There's some majors that don't have data, but that's because those are um, really small. So this is for transfers. It's a lot different for freshmen. I think um, if you see the general freshman admission data in terms of um, like average GPA for those who got admitted and like test scores um, and then the percent, that, that would give you a better idea for um, freshman admission. But specifically for transfers, um, there's a lot of information for that. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, first of all, for sharing. Um, I just want to ask you, um, Sena, you mentioned that you applied to applied math, I think, and then you transferred to computer science, right? So I just wanted to ask, like, was that a, like a strategic, um, like, app, like way of app applying? Because I know that CS is really competitive, or or was it like, really hard later to transfer to CS when you're when you got in, or how'd you go about that? So um, it's changed a lot now. Um, the major of computer science is now in a different college at UC Berkeley. So it's direct admit from now on. And I got in before that policy happened. Um, so it wasn't strategic. I was actually really interested in math. And um, I just realized after I got to Berkeley, it wasn't something I wanted to do necessarily. Um, I think once I started taking the upper divs, which are um, junior, senior level classes. Um, it wasn't what I expected it to be. And I feel like I should have looked into them before I committed to Berkeley. And that's something I would suggest is um, look at the major specifically um, at each school before you commit to one. And um, it was hard to transfer into the CS major because Everyone who applies to CS or at that time needed to meet a GPA requirement, which is pretty tough to me. And um, I did end up meeting it, but I didn't stay in the major. So I just have that like background in computer science. It's something that I think is really valuable. But um, specifically now going forward um, in terms of CS admission to UC Berkeley, it's definitely a lot more competitive. I think Ali has met um, some of the new admits who are starting this fall who got in for freshman admission. And um, maybe he can talk a little bit more about some of the experiences they had from what they've told him. Um, but I, can't, I can only talk about my experience, but it doesn't really apply anymore. But I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so essentially, like, what are the main qualities of like freshman admits for this new class? So for context, uh, UC Berkeley just actually established a new college of computing. Uh, it's called CDSS for Computing, Data Science, and Society. It's the College of Computing. Um, so like CS, data science, and statistics are housed within this college. So um, it's kind of a new scene for kind of everyone here at Berkeley because we're like, oh, like I came in from a process that no longer exists, which was like um, the CS major within the College of Letters and Sciences, which is like the general college, and now it's in a focus college. So for a lot of things I've seen with direct admin, I think this is like stuff that kind of like a lot of college students do. So if you're trying to get a little bit of a leg up, um, I think just work on building things. Um, and so think about like problems that you have in your life. It could be as simple as like, yo, I like don't like my to-do list app, so let me just build my own that specifically fits my own needs. Um, and I think like you'll realize that there's other people that have this problem, and then it's like, oh, maybe I can sell this to you. And now you're also making money off of like code that you wrote. Uh, welcome to the entire field of CS. So there's like stuff you can build. Um, I think hackathons are a good way to just force yourself to do it around like surrounded by people that are also trying to build things. Um, usually a lot of them are like between 24 to 48 hours. There's like Usually a bunch of them you can find online. You just have to like Google it and you can find it. Um, but I think the number one thing with like hackathons, especially if you're trying to break into tech, is it forces you to like start thinking about like what are the business ideas I can come up with? What are like specific themes? Like if it's like a sustainability thing um, or like climate, it's like, oh, maybe we can build a tool to like help firefighters analyze like wildfire data and see like where the next most likely wildfire spot is um, just based on like past data. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, but I think like the number one thing is like you just have to take like it's kind of like writing, right? You just need to start like doing it and then figure out like how to iterate and like refine the process as you go along. So I think if you're trying to break into tech, just start building things like you'll just come across everything else like in that process. There's a lot you learn just by doing things yourself. Actually, if you don't mind, I want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So, advice: just just do it. Like literally, like and especially with the applications, they want to see people who have done unique things. Um, I'm really proud of my little brother right now. He just started his own business, and he's going to go into the easy application. So that's going to set him apart. Um, and there's a couple of resources that I want to share with you guys, especially the the, the youngsters, that I think are very very good. So please, everyone, note this down. This has been. Uh, absolute hack, extern.com. I don't know if you guys have heard of it too, but it's basically externships, not internships, they're externships. Some of them are paid, some of them are specifically for community college students. And essentially what they are is a project based um, externship uh, that when you work with a real company. So I'm actually doing one with Beats by Dre right now. You can throw it on your LinkedIn and Super, it's a, it's a hack. It's a hack, honestly. So just like, just go on extern, go on forge.com is another one. Like, just literally just do it. Just, just put your mind and do it. Like, you can sit and like think, hey, I want to be well planned about this. I want to be well thought out. I can't waste time. Um, it is good to be well thought out, but just write, write that piece of code, write that blog, write that article, whatever. Just do it. Just put your thoughts on paper. I totally 100% want to agree with Ellie on that. It's the, and then the UCs are really going to like that, initi uh, that initiative. So, sorry to. Jump in there. I also wanted to add one thing. As a high schooler, if you are applying to a certain major, for instance, if you're interested in um, bio, CS, or anything, one thing I've seen people do, one of my friends, he was doing software, applying uh, for CS. As a high schooler, he decided to take a class at a community college for CS. He got an introduction, and he did well. He got an A. Uh, if you do that, you show that, it shows like, okay, cool. This guy knows what he's doing. He's done this class. Because some of those classes are transferable to the UC. So you're able to see that. You get an introduction. And then they say, okay, cool. This guy has an understanding of it, too. We don't need to worry so much. So yeah, that's a to find the classes that transfer directly, uh, even as a high schooler, you can go on assist.org. And it'll show the community colleges. And you can see what classes transfer where. I think that's, uh, that's one hack that you guys can use as well. So, yeah. Assist.org? Assist.org. And what was the, you said extern, and there was another site you mentioned. Yeah, so forage.com is like F-O-R-G-E. F-O-R-A-G-E. Um, it's essentially, it's a little bit different than extern. They're not paid. But what it'll do is it'll give you like real companies kind of have, uh, like it's a virtual work experience program, which is kind of like a simulation. I would be less confident putting that on your LinkedIn, but it'll definitely give you 
uh, a real look into what it's like to work at a real company um, of any different size. You can filter by like finance projects, uh, SWE projects, even some uh, health sciences projects. So definitely check those out. Extern, E X T E R N um, dot com, and then yeah, just like network and, and be proactive. Brothers. Assalamualaikum. Um, if you guys don't mind me asking, and if you remember, what were your cumulative GPAs when you guys applied, to like for the UC, um, when you put it into UC application? I'll start because I probably have had the worst at a three point five. Um, unweighted, I. Oh, I actually don't remember. I think it was somewhere between three point seven to three point nine. Weighted was around like four point four five in high school. In high school, I had a 3.5, maybe weighted. Yeah, I don't remember. It was a while back. I did really bad. But yeah, uh, and then at CC, I had a 4.0. I also didn't do too great in high school. I had like a 3.9 weighted with lots of APs, so it was very weighted. <laughs> um, I had a 4.0 in high school and community college, but I didn't take APs, so just disclaimer and um i will say just because we had good gpas um before berkeley doesn't mean we still have good gpas uh for the one girl that like that left foothill was there like a reason or something that like pushed you like something about the environment of foothill that made you want to leave um, I decided to take the chess bee more because I wanted an intellectual like challenge. Um, I didn't feel I knew I didn't want to apply as a freshman admit, so um, I felt like I was kind of stuck in the high school environment. I didn't have a lot of opportunity to take the classes that I actually wanted to and advance as fast as I wanted to. So in community college, um, every math class is a semester, not a full year. So I was able to like accelerate through all the advanced math way faster than if I had stayed in um, high school. So it was more of um, an academic choice rather than a situational one. Uh, I also wanted to add, I went into classes at Foothill. It's a great school. There's a great environment. So if any of you guys are, you know, just wanted to add that. Do you think there's a difference in what college you see if you take more community college classes over APs? Wait, could you repeat that question? Um, do you think you see, like, admission officers or, like, the colleges in general see community college classes in a different way than APs? AP classes or like they would prefer one or the other okay so I will say um, I think taking APs in high school um, definitely shows like you're able to take on like a much harder workload uh, I do have like maybe this might be a hot take maybe it's not but this was like my personal story and I think it worked out really well for me was um, I actually like so like I was like a try hard in high school and so I pretty much so my high school is IB so kind of the same thing as AP um, and so I was like stacking up on like IB classes and um, like APs as well in my high school. I took none of the exams. So I actually took like zero AP exams and zero IB exams. I actually took one AP and I failed it. So it was APCS too. That's the funny part. So um, and the reason being is uh, I actually ended up coming in as a freshman with transfer level standing. And the reason why is because community college classes. Um, so here's the breakdown, right? So AP is like if you pass the exam with like a four or a five, which is like, it's on a scale of one to five. So if you pass with like a four or five, then you have like the chance to get college credit. If you fail it, you don't get college credit. So it's a gamble. You spend the entire year taking the class and then you take the exam at the end of the year and all of a sudden like, if you don't make it, then you don't get college credit. Um, or, get this, you could take a community college class, which is a college class, and regardless of whatever grade you get in it, as long as it's passing, you get college credit. So it's like, would you like to gamble the college credit or just have it guaranteed if you pass the class, right? So um, for me, like when I was taking CC classes in high school, my thought was, okay, sure, I'll like grind through like all the APs and IBs and whatever, just because like I'm a try hard. But 
the real financial benefit you get is like if you take CC classes, like you're just getting college credit. Like you don't have to do it in like university because university is expensive. Um, even like something like the UCs, like I assume everyone here is in state or like shall like soon to be in state. Um, but like it costs like 15,000 a year just for tuition alone. And you go to a place like Berkeley in the Bay Area, housing's expensive. So you, like you add more numbers and you know, the costs rack up pretty fast. So if you can knock out classes like ahead of time and like have the flexibility to just take like relevant classes to you, like in university, I think, you know, I think that's the number one thing. 100%, yeah. Because um, bear in mind, like the AP is owned by College Board, which is not a government entity, it's a company that is like nonprofit, but they make a lot of money off of like kids gambling their college credit. Um, and like schools are going to promote it because like it makes them look good. Um, so just think about where the money flows and you'll realize that CC is actually like the hidden gem out of all of it. I also wanted to add when my friends were taking classes in high school, they would go see these people that were playing in hours and hours and hours studying for these exams. And then they would just take the CC class and they're like, oh my God, that was so much easier. You know, you can go talk to people. They'll say, hey, take this teacher. That's one thing I learned so much by reaching out to the Muslim students. It'll be like, you know, this class, it's pretty easy. You should go to class. They'll help you. The teachers really care about you in community college, too. They'll help you get an A. And you're able to do that during while you're in high school, I feel, too. So, yeah, you'll know the workload. They'll give you backgrounds. Rate my professor. It's a really big hack. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I think for the first question or the first question I answered, um, there's a website called Transfers by Major, which has UC admission data for transfer students. And you will see that there are certain majors where if you transfer into them, um, there's like a 50, 60 percent admission rate for transfers. Um, so those are typically more um, non-competitive majors. Um, the competitive majors like CS is like 5%, so it's actually less than the freshman admission rate. So, how, how is it? Yeah. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, um, but I recommend looking up the website. And um, you can see not just Berkeley, but also each um, other UC and their um, majors as well. Um, but I know that specific majors, um, if you're looking for competitive majors, um, it can be easier to get into as opposed to freshman admission. Um, one quick question. In terms of tech majors, um, if you're not so into coding, um, and, but you want a hard, like, more hard tech degree, what's a good tech um, industry degree to go into? Like, oh. say you don't want, like, um, you know, you want a more hard degree and you want... Um, something related to tech, but you don't, you're not into coding. What's something that you can go into that um, would help you kind of still earn that, you know, tech credit, but like not necessarily be coding related? So you just described me. Um, I, I don't, I, well, I, I, I kind of fell in love with coding very, very recently, way after I got into Berkeley, but I majored in cognitive science, and there's kind of six um, components of cognitive science. Let's see if I can remember all of them. So it's anthropology, linguistics, um, artificial intelligence, which is the hard, harder part, um, psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy. So that obviously covers a wide range. So if you get into CogSci at Berkeley, then you can say, OK, I did CogSci, which has AI, neuroscience, and harder stuff. But you could also just take all the philosophy classes, which I'm not going to say it's less hard, but there's not going to be as much coding. You can definitely market yourself. Um, as someone who's technically skilled. And um, I personally am pursuing a career in like UX and having coding skills is very, uh, uh, um, it, it, it helps the market. Um, there are prereqs for CogSci, which are coding. And the reality is, I'm just gonna say it right now, just, just you're gonna have to code if you want to like, if you want a, 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 a career in tech, um, you're gonna have to code like a little bit and I say just like there's so many resources out there that make it fun.
fun and also like once you like get over the like the I guess like the stigma around it it's actually very very enjoyable and you can do really cool stuff I'm sure I like, can go into some of the cool projects he's done like he built a, a graveyard searcher like that's so sick you know so um, um I mean MTC <laughs> um but yeah, so I would say Cogsci is, is that. And then to, to, I wanted to say something else about um, your question, Uncle. Um, like Senna was saying, there are some there are some uh, majors that are like I, I think rhetoric when I was applying had a seventy percent acceptance rate um, as for transfers. So what some what like what you can do is you can apply to like a major like rhetoric that has a higher acceptance rate, and then like minor in data science or minor in a tech or minor in computer science and minor in a more technical one, and you can definitely again market yourself. Um, once you get into the school, you can. Uh, th th that's always an option. You can. So. I also wanted to add. You were talking about CC versus uh, high school. If you're above for a few colleges in a uh, few UCs, there's guaranteed admission that you can get a transfer admission guaranteed if you're above a certain GPA. So, it's called tag, tag. So, for me during that time, I think it was a 3.2 GPA was guaranteed admission at UC Davis. Whereas I know people, I, I was like, uh, I know people who got beyond 4.0s this year and they didn't get admission at UC Davis. So that's a big perspective. As long as you finish the requirements, like four or five classes, you can have guaranteed admission as long as you're above a certain GPA range. Not for Berkeley, UCLA, or UCSD. Uh, you were talking about the externship program. Uh, like, how old do you have to be to do the externship? There's, uh, there's no. I didn't see any age requirements. Um, I, I think the whole idea, and I really like this mission, is to give people who don't have experience experience. Um, so there are some that are actually like only for community college students. Um, so I don't think. Uh, how old do you? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I'm 16. Yeah, you, 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 sh you should be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a lot different. Um, like I said before, we might have 4.0s before when we're applying, but it's not necessarily we have a good GPA when we get in. So in my first year, I was starting off as an applied math major, and I took, I started, I, so I was junior standing, so I could start taking um, junior level classes. So I was taking um, two math classes in my first two semesters, and I failed all of them. So it was really hard. It's definitely um, something that I warn everyone who's going into technical majors is be sure to look into the curriculum that you're going into before you commit to a school or a major um, and decide if that's actually what you want to learn or something that you think you would be comfortable learning. So going back to what you were talking about, like community college courses are definitely taught in a way that is, um, it doesn't really, or at least math classes, we weren't being set up to succeed in higher level math courses. So the basis of math is um, getting proofwriting skills, especially at the advanced level. And when you're taking, you know, multivariable calc, linear algebra, differential equations, you're still learning, um, well, maybe not linear algebra, but you're still learning like formulas and problem solving skills as opposed to how can I take everything I like I know and apply it to different scenarios, different questions and generalize these concepts um, and that's something that's really core at the advanced level of math is being able to generalize things and you get hit with a specific question and using your like your toolkit of proofs or theorems and being able to solve those problems. So I would say it is a lot different, um, especially at Berkeley. So I can't really speak for the other UCs, but um, I would say Berkeley, UCLA, maybe UCSD are some of the more advanced ones. That's where you're going to see that curriculum difference for sure.
Um, I think a lot of what we all talked about was going out of your way to um, gain new skills and experiences and really challenge yourself. I think um, putting yourself in positions where you're constantly learning and being challenged with um, problems or situations that you've never experienced, gaining those skills, especially in the field that you're going to study, is most important. Um, so I think like for the example of math is going out of your way and doing personal projects. Same with CS, like Ali was talking about um, hackathons, like going out of your way um, to get those experiences that people in like UC Berkeley, so um, freshman admits are going to get like right off the bat at UC Berkeley. I actually did want to add one more thing. Um, like, I think once you get to university, it's a very humbling experience. Um, it doesn't matter like how try hard you are. Like when you ask that question about like, what's the level of difficulty? Like when you go from like CC or high school to like university, we all kind of looked at each other because there was like a shared like, like we're all from like different majors, but we all have this like shared experience of like once we got to Berkeley, we all got humbled. Um, there's just like once you get to university, it's not just Berkeley, like it could be Davis or like literally any other university. The number one shared experience is if you're going to a hard major, it's it's known as a hard major for a reason. Um, even going into Berkeley, like I had like some coding experience going in. Um, the very intro CS class, so this was like CS 61A, that's what it's called. Um, first midterm, the average was a 60% on the exam. I got a 40%. Um, and so for me, like taking like one of the fattest L's I've taken on an exam, like, and that's my first one too. And I just like got the results and like that just ruined my day. I was like slumped on the couch. My roommate like walks and he's like, yo, like you good. And I'm like, dude, I don't deserve to be here, man. And there's, like, if you go through, like, my snap memories, like, there's a lot of snaps of me just, like, in a hoodie, just, like, I give up, guys. Like, I'm so done with this. And that's just the reality. Um, like, when you, when you like, kind of um, think you're at the top and then you realize there's something bigger, like, there's, like, a bigger fish, there's, like, literally always a bigger fish. And coming into, like, university, you're, like, surrounded by people that are, like, smarter than you. And I think that's a really good thing, too. Because if you're the smartest person in the room, then, like, there's not really much in that room for you to gain. Um, and so I think one piece of advice I like to give people is always try to be the dumbest person in the room because then you have the most to learn. Um, and I think like coming into a university um, like Berkeley, um, I very much felt like the dumbest person in the room, but kind of like having that mindset of like, okay, like I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed, but like you learn how to take each failure as like a point of growth. I was like, okay, I flunked a midterm like how do I do better on the next one and then I flunked that one and I was like okay how do I do better on the final and then like I finessed the final and I was like oh great like there is hope and then I flunked another midterm and I was like it's just this never-ending cycle but there is learning going on right because if you're failing then that means that you have something to learn if you if you're like perfect at everything then you've got nothing to learn why are you going to school just drop out right but the value of school is that because you're learning the only way you learn is because you've never done it before and you've never done it the right way before. So I think it's just like a lot of experimentation. Um, I think that's like the number one thing. Like there will be a jump in difficulty like of any technical major. Do a little better on the midterm? <laughs> No, um, I think, but it's like, again, like hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Um, like I could go back and change like a lot of things, like, but then again, at that point in time, I was operating at the best, with the best knowledge I had, right? I was like, okay, I'll grind like a bunch of past midterms and I'll just do like five of them and I think I should be good to go. Um, but then there's like strategy involved in that that I didn't learn until like years later. Um, and like, there's a lot of things I don't know now. Like I'm barely pushing my twenties and like, I have so much to learn too. So, yeah. um, do you think it's better to go straight to a UC out of high school, or is it better to go to a CC and then UC? I would say like apply, um, the, you know, and then if you don't get in, you could go to CC. That's for, like the short answer. Um, I don't know if people agree with that. I would say it depends on like if you have 
a major already in mind that you're already in love with and you've already explored, then apply for UCs and go straight into it. But if you're still open to exploring different fields, like say you're between math and you're between CS and bio, like go to community college, save your money, you know, go into these fields with without the pressure of like that social and external environment and kind of like ease your way into it. Um, so I guess it depends on you um, and what you're interested in, in particular. I have um. I was just gonna add one thing. Uh, a lot of these schools, if you're not going to UC, these out-of-state schools, I was looking at it to my friends and I, it was around 70K a year total, which 70K is a lot, you know, it's a lot for any school. And you go to CC, it's maybe $1,000 a year. So you save a lot of money and then you have guaranteed admission to, so there's a big safety net. That's my take on it, but you always try and apply. You have nothing to lose by applying, so yeah. Super quickly. Also, um, this is a little bit off topic, but once you're in a university, you can also take CC classes. A lot of times they fulfill requirements. Um, I wish I knew this. There's a class called CS70. I probably made shutters go across this entire panel. Very hard class. Right after I took it and scraped away with a B-. minus. Um, uh, I found out that I could have taken a requirement that filled that in community college and probably would have gotten a much better grade, had a better time. So um, don't be afraid to take community college classes. Um, they are there for you as a resource. That's a little topic, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, so um, on the topic of probation, I will say I'm speaking from, oh uh, sure. All right, can we see some hands? Um, oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, so who was uh, the person that was taking a, a pre-med major? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you personally, um, I saw that you took MCB, right? Or I was microbial biology, so oh. it's an adjacent biology, yeah. Yeah, so I'm also taking a microbial, or I'm taking MCB, mm -hmm. but I guess my question was, this is, you don't have to answer this, but do you regret taking like a major that you can't really escape out of? Like um, you have to go through the doctor route? No, because I learned through my field. Okay. So first gen, I thought the only decision was being a doctor if I was bio. Um, turns out that's not the only option. So right now I'm working as a research associate and then building up my resume so I can apply back for grad school. But this is all based on my own terms. I don't regret taking a pre-med major necessarily. Um, it does it does uh, shorten the list of you know possible jobs that you can apply for besides going to grad school or getting um, going to medical school. But I'd say if you're passionate in it, and you know you're okay with taking a little bit of a financial cut then go for it and you'll you'll find the like the jobs that are meant for you if you're not interested in medical school um throughout college and there there are actually a lot i think it's like i think we think what we the only option we have is going to medical school for bio but that's not the reality of it um and yeah i can definitely help out as well if you're interested in anything like that okay. thank you mm -hmm. um i wanted to qu quick just follow up on that is um when you said you can help out, is there any opportunities for these students to get mentors or help from um, either your org or like other places near Berkeley or so how can they get connected to get help, things like that if anybody needs support? It is amazing that you asked that question. Um, so for um, us with MTCU, like we're just getting kind of started with um, our semester in Berkeley, but inshallah, like we're planning on doing like essay review office hours. So for those of you that are applying, um, we'll have like some availabilities. Um, across the Bay Area, we're also kind of working on figuring out like how do we set up like actual mentorship programs. Um, I've been part of a few, I've ran a few. Um, and I think like the number one thing that like a lot of those mentorship pro programs struggle with is like the consistency. So we're kind of working out like right now details on like how we can get like proper mentorship programs. So it's not just like a one time call of like, hey, how did you get into college? And that's it. Um, so I think like providing like more personalized support. So inshallah, like um, I think like for us, like our organization is Muslim Tech Collaborative. Um, for those of you that have LinkedIn, uh, if you just search up Muslim Tech Collaborative, 
uh, will be like the first result. So stay tuned with that. Um, I think like other, a lot of other schools as MSAs also have um, like their own mentorship programs as well. Um, they'll, they might do like shadowing or like just, you know, just like panels like these. So I would look out for those. Um, yeah, I think it's like the number one thing is like just like the power of just Googling a bunch of things is also very helpful for me. Like I found a lot of opportunities by literally just like Googling like mentorship program, like San Joaquin Valley or something like that. Um, and I think that helps like a lot as well, but yeah, especially within the Muslim community, we have a lot of opportunities. Um, and also kind of on that, like asking for help slide, there's just, like people in, like, this is a huge masjid. This is the largest one in the East Bay. There's a pretty solid chance that like, there is probably someone like praying right next to you that like, once they're done praying, just like, just like turn to them, just ask them like, Hey, what do you do? And there's a pretty solid chance that like, you might, uh, you keep doing that at one point, you'll probably find someone that's like, you know, it's like, Hey, like, what do you do? And it's like, Oh, I do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to do X, Y, Z. Like what, like, how'd you get into it? And it's like a lot of these things come organically. So, yeah. Assalamualaikum. I'm so I'm a senior. I'm applying right now. And I know, I'm not sure what the UC process is on this, but I know a lot of my senior friends, like what they're doing is they want to go into a certain major, like a capstone major at Berkeley, let's say. Um, but because it's like a capstone major and it's really hard to get into, they just find another major in the same college, apply to that and then transfer in. I just wanted to get like your opinion. Is that something like worthwhile doing or? That's what I did. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, I think so. Um, it Again, a lot of the majors, they kind of nerf that um, because uh, CDSS, they nerfed it. Um, so you can't do statistics, data science, or CS anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it worked when I was applying. I would look into it more specifically with each major because they've also made it, Berkeley's becoming a bit more strict with it. Like you can't change into some majors anymore. So you have to really look into that. Reach, as I said before, reach out to people who are in Berkeley, who are in this colleges, who have gone through this process. Specifically, Muslim people. We love to help each other. We have our whole panel right here. You have our names. My link, my name's right up there. You can search me up LinkedIn, Instagram. I'll always be happy to help. So just reach out, and so we can always push you to the right person as well. Um, I just want to say we're kind of short on time, so we're going to take two more questions. I think we did a lot of questions from the brother side, so if any sisters have any last questions, um, we can answer that. Anybody? Questions? Or anybody. If anybody on the sister side doesn't have questions, we can go back to the brother side. Assalamualaikum. So I was wondering if it's like a bad idea to do concurrent uh, enrollment in like a community college, take uh, take outside courses while you're in high school. I did that. I don't think it's a bad idea at all, honestly. I think so long as you don't overload yourself and you're you know what you're capable of, I think just go ahead and do it. Because then also you'll be able to, you have the outside perspective of community college that's giving you like some sort of insight as to how college courses go and how they're formulated. Um, and then you also have high school. So that's your, that's your base. Not too much to add to that. Um, I think, yeah, like that was something I did as well. Um, like I say, just try a couple of quite, like courses out. Um, if anything, just start with like the English classes because those are like almost always transferable. Uh, like English 1A or 1B. LOSPO, I think, calls it like English 4A and 4B. There's, it's different for every college. But um, I would just start with the introductory English classes, see how you like those. And uh, if you like take those and you decide like I don't want to do CC classes in high school, at least uh, now you have like some college credit that is transferable regardless. So thank you for this great presentation. I'm a parent here. Um, there's a lot of chatter about the value of college. You think it's worthwhile to apply to college? Ooh, this, this, this is a good question. Uh, the question is about the value of college. Is it worth to apply to college? Does anyone have any hot takes? I think it depends, honestly, on what you're interested in. Like, I feel like, I feel like if you're CS, 
this a lot of the skills I mean I'm not CS here but I've heard that a lot of the skills that you pick up are actually in your job so if you can learn these languages and like be able to figure out these projects on your own then I guess I don't see the point of college but if you're interested in something more like soft stem I guess so like bio would be me um, then yes definitely college uh, it teaches you a lot of valuable skills yeah can I add something real quick to that? Um, so um, I majored in sociology in college and then I got married, had kids and didn't really ever work. But then once my kids grew up, I wanted to work and I was like, what can I do now that I haven't worked? Um, so I kind of did exploration of myself and saw what I'm good at and what I like to do. And I just kind of went out to different nonprofits because I thought that, you know, I can find different um, you know, areas that interest me, like community service and different things, and just get involved. And through that, I found out that um, I'm really good at fundraising and development and helping nonprofits succeed. And that's what I got into. And, like, that's something that I did that was not related to my field, but work that I do now. And I'm, like, on multiple boards. And on, I'm on the board of MCC here. Um, so, you know, you just have to find where your passions lie. And then sometimes that can help you get a job. I'm not st telling anybody not to go to college, but there are avenues to get jobs without going to college. Yeah, so kind of going off of that, um, it really depends on if you know what you want to do in the future or not. So if you're dead set on being a lawyer, you have to go to college. Um, there's really no other option. Um, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there's a lot of um, wiggle room there. I know a lot of, um, I think maybe parents can relate to this, if maybe you didn't have a college degree. Uh, and you immigrated to the U.S., um, there's still ways to be successful. And um, college isn't really everyone's path. Um, I think it's really deciding on what is best for you. And um, there was one more thing I wanted to add that I cannot remember. But um, yeah, just, oh, going off of what you said, um, at Berkeley, I've met a lot of people who are in majors that aren't necessarily related to um, something like business, for example. So I've met a lot of people in um, English who are pre-law and go on to uh, apply and get into law school. I've met people who are studying sociology or psychology who end up being consultants um, in a business field or healthcare consultants. Like, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the skills that you learn and you practice as opposed to what you study. So I think at Berkeley specifically, our um, the mission of a UC is really to produce leaders. Um, the difference between a UC and a CSU is that um, Cal State's emphasis is really on producing good workers and people who are going to add value to the workforce, but UCs produce leaders, people who are going to be in charge of that workforce. So it's really just knowing yourself as a person and um, understanding what role you want to play in your future. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to add one thing to that. Uh, the value of the college degree itself as very as a subjective is going to change between each person. For me specifically, I'm a business major. A lot of the stuff that I learn, you can maybe learn that through YouTube videos, all that. But one thing I've learned in college is more of like independence, all of that. Because I, when I'm, I'm lived at home for many years, I moved to college. I was like, yo, where do I get food? You know, I was relying on my mom. I was relying on my dad for money. You get a lot of independence. You go through hard, you learn to work hard, you know, uh, especially all of us at Berkeley. We, when we came to Berkeley, we, our work ethic has changed. Ber uh, Berkeley, I think itself, it shapes hard workers more than anything. You're, you leave Berkeley with it. You, we leave Berkeley with an insanely better work ethic than you came in. I feel like that's more, you know, a work ethic is insanely good work ethic, independence, that's very useful as a college life. A lot of stuff that you're going to do in college, you learn, you can maybe learn that later on or stuff. It depends on your major, of course, bio, law, law changes, but a lot of it, independence, work ethic, that makes you grow up, become more mature, and ready to, you know, go into actual adult life, I'd say. So I'd say it's very valuable. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. Um, so I actually like go back and forth, like is college necessary, is it not necessary, and I, I do have a lot of opinions, but I think something that has kind of channeled me into what I'm about to say now is the market is like, it's so bad, and I would not be surprised if like, it, like 
you'll see on LinkedIn a job posting for like a UX design intern, like zero years of experience, right? And then it'll have 500 applications in three hours. And I'm not even exaggerating. Those are the numbers. So there's no way that a recruiter is going to look through 500 applications, much less the thousands that come in the next coming days. And how they filter it is they have these ATS scanners that filter. And I'm, I'm not, don't take my word on it, but I would not be surprised if they filtered by do they have a degree or not, are they studying or not. And um, I think another thing that's super beneficial about college is not just the skills and education. There's also the connections and the network, kind of like what Rayhan was saying. It's, it's, there's so many people that I w would have not have met. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I met my wife uh, from college. So um, there's so many people that I would not have met, so many uh, opportunities that I would not have um, gotten. Um, uh, I could, it's like, at least two logos on my LinkedIn were directly from people that I met through college. So in a career like UX, it's very possible to have UX boot camps um, and you know you can just spend six months learning and you can go get a job. But with the state of the market right now um, and with all the other benefits, I would say like definitely college is very, very good and very, very, uh, I don't know if I would say necessary, but like I'm leaning more to that side just because of the people you meet, the people you get to be around, and then everyone has a similar mindset. Um, and um, yeah, so. All right, I have also a lot of opinions on this. So um, actually, funny enough, I was at a panel uh, earlier this summer um, that was literally like the title of the panel was Should You Drop Out of College? Um, and so for context, I, like, I'm finishing up my final year in college, so I think I did not drop out. Um, my freshman year roommate actually did uh, right after freshman year. So, um, and his story was a little... Allah. All right, I can share my opinions later on this. So just to close that off, um, just a quick TLDR of um, my answer. If you're considering, like, if you're asking the question of should I drop out or not, pretty solid chance that you should not. Um, the people that do drop out, um, for example, my freshman year roommate, um, so he was working uh, at like a venture capital firm and it was like the question was for him, like, can I balance school with like the work I'm doing right now? And the question was, the answer was no. Like he was working like 40, 50, 60 hours a week on just his job alone. And so school didn't make sense. Um, but I also think there's a lot of value in a degree. Again, like the network, the people you meet, um, and also just like the community that you're a part of. There's a lot of different things like on campus alone, like whether oh, it's, look, yeah. Okay, we should probably go pray. But yeah, Jazakallah khair everyone uh, for coming through. I just wanted to say thank you, um, Ali, Daniel, Rehan, Malak, Malik, and um, Sana. We really appreciate you guys this time and for coming out to MCC. Thank you so much again. All right. And donate to Muslim Tech Collaborative, yes. please. Let me uh, open yeah. up that slide. Okay. We can. You can leave it open so they can. Yeah. yeah. All right, Jazakum Al Khair, everyone. Thank you guys so much.